So let's say we could have a substantive discussion with an evolutionist. Mm -hmm. What's, I'll, I'll frame it that way. What would be the key points I would give to him? Or you might even say if you're on the elevator with someone and, oh, you're a creationist, yes. Well, isn't that religion? No, it's, it's very scientific. What? So, so what would you tell them? In a nutshell, what I would tell them is creation explains the obvious evidence equally well as evolution does. Mm -hmm. So going back to 1859, one of Darwin's main points was that it looks like species have migrated to their present location. So if you look at the distribution of species around the globe, say uh, mammals and birds, what you find is mammals are distributed, land mammals are distributed among all sorts of land continents, and they tend to be missing from islands. And the species we find on islands are those that can swim there or fly there, and they tend to be lacking land creatures. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the evidences Darwin cited, and so his conclusion was species have migrated to their present locations, and that was one of his arguments against the creationism of his day. Well, the Bible doesn't teach the fixity of species or that God created them in their present location. There was a uh, rather significant event in Genesis chapters six through eight, which mm -hmm. say the whole surface of the earth was erased and the land dependent air breathing creatures survived on board the ark and restarted in the Middle East and therefore must have migrated to their present locations. So creationists agree with Darwin's argument in that sense. They explain that obvious evidence fairly equally well. He also made arguments about the similarities between the domestic breeds of species, like the various breeds of donkeys and horses and so forth, uh, compared them to the species in the wild and, and made an argument for the formation of a limited number of species from that perspective. And, and that's the type of argument I would agree with him as well. So on the elevator, I'd say creation explains the obvious evidence equally well. Some of Darwin's simpler arguments, but still relevant in his day, we explain them equally well. I'd say creationism explains the popular evidences for evolution equally well. And we'll just cover a few here. For example, this argument from homology or the similarity. So homo meaning the same, ology meaning the study of the study of biological sameness. You can see the structure of the forelimb here in several creatures, human, I think this is frog, bat, porpoise, horse, you can see from, from top to bottom, there's a similar structure, one bone, two bones, and then the wrist bones and digits. There's a similar pattern in each of these species. The underlying details differ from one to another, but there's an underlying pattern. Evolutionists say there's no explanation except that these five species must have inherited this pattern from a common ancestor. Well, if you look at how humans design things in the world today, and Genesis 1 says we're made in God's image, so there's something about us that reflects something about God. So if we, if we find a pattern in which humans have designed things, this may give us some hints into the patterns in which God designed things. We design vehicles with underlying similar anatomy, you could call it. There's a similar structure to a car and a truck and, and so forth. And the reason for that is not because engineers sat down and said, let's try to make and, and design vehicles in a pattern that most resembles common ancestry. It's because the pattern works. And so that same principle applies equally well to the biological world. This sort of structure and pattern works. Or a favorite question I like to ask people who criticize the design patterns of life is, well, how would you design it differently? Someone was trying to, mm -hmm. I, I was at a chiropractor and he was complaining about the bad design in the human spine. I said, well, what would you dif do different? And, and he really hummed and hawed and didn't have a good answer. They love to criticize. Yeah. And, and one of the things I've learned as evolutionists, and, and I can personally <coughs> attest this, but I also lack this, biologists, evolutionary biologists, never get trained in principles of design and engineering. It's Their, their argument is basically, well, I wouldn't design it this way, therefore it cannot be designed this way. It's, it's really a sad state of affairs. Another common popular evidence revolution, so this is one of the ones you'll find in textbooks, and creation explains it equally well, we design things in so so-called homologous patterns why wouldn't god do the same thing i alluded to this just a few minutes ago but we do not believe in the fixity of species we don't believe that god created the red fox the arctic fox all the various breeds of domestic dogs the walrus all separate rather god created kinds of creatures is what genesis chapter one says and the general rule of thumb for this seems to be that it's at the level of family not species or even genus that's that's a classification level and so this uh 
this represents probably the best approximation that we have now for the created type, which means Noah takes two of each kind on board the ark, new species form within those kinds after the flood, but you don't see changing of one kind into another. You don't see foxes changing into cats. You see all sorts of breeds of wolves and coyotes and foxes and various, uh, various species of those and various breeds of dogs, variation within a kind, but not change from one kind into another. So evolutionists love to trumpet the formation of new species as evidence for evolution. Well, of course they form, they form within kinds. What you don't see though, and evolutionists do not cite examples of this as change from one kind into another. They try to, they try to come up with evidence for this. They'll cite things like transitional forms, like this is Tiktaalik here, an artist's reconstruction of the features that they would say represent the, the, the intermediate state between a, a ocean water dwelling creature and a land dependent land dwelling creature. It has a head like a amphibian or reptile and scales and limbs like a fish and the limbs look like half limbs, half legs. See, they say, here's the evidence for the, the popular evidence for changes of one kind into another massive wholesale change between two fundamentally different types of creatures. And do they even think about what a design explanation might be? Probably not. If they do, it's, well, I wouldn't design it this way, therefore God wouldn't design it this way. Well, let's take a more rational approach to this. How do humans design things? Let's think of the military. We design cruisers, all sorts of warships for bringing firepower across the oceans. We design tanks for bringing uh, firepower on all sorts of land terrain. And if we want to move between the oceans the water and land, we design transitional forms, <laughs> amphibious assault vehicles that can function as boats, not as good as warships, but they do their job in the water and they, they can function on land, not as good as tanks, but they do the job that they need to. They're perfect for the transitional environment between between water and land. So when we see something like Tiktaalik, oh, it's a transitional form. Yes, but humans naturally design so-called transitional forms we explain this obvious evidence equally well. So we explain the obvious evidences equally well, like the evidence from migration, the evidence that there's limited amount of speciation that's happened comparing breeds to species. And I discussed some of these in, in much more detail in both books. And we, did, and, and we explain transitional forms equally well. And we, we could go on and on about the, the other popular evidences for evolution. We explain the obvious ones equally well, popular ones equally well. What I'd say though is, is what makes it and, and what, the type of evidence that's supremely in favor of design would be the obvious design of life. Mm -hmm. Think about the amount of effort and money and manpower and mental energies exerted at helping the world's best, best athletes perform better. There's a lot of science that goes into it. And yet when we look at nature, the aerodynamic shape of the dolphin and other types of sea creatures, we often marvel at the designs and the engineering and the the achievements that we see in nature, so to speak. And if if we have yet to achieve that, in fact, scientists are taking inspiration from what we see in nature. If the best minds, the best human minds on the planet have yet to achieve this sort of design and engineering, it points to a, a supreme intelligence behind this. And of course, you can think of all the various types of athletes from swimmers to runners. Again, you see supreme design in nature. So the most fundamental fact of biology is the appearance of design. Even Richard Dawkins recognizes that life looks designed yeah. and he wants you to believe that evolution provides a better explanation. Intuitively, we all know that, no, that doesn't make sense. You, they, they try to come up with, well, here's, here's something that could plausibly explain it, fine. Well, it, it could be that the moon is made of green cheese and I might be able to come up with mutations and natural selection as a scientifically plausible sounding way to explain how this could have occurred. Of course, with evolution, there, one of the differences between the, the green cheese analogy and, and evolution is Michael Bay, he's done a lot of work. He's not a creationist, but he's done a lot of work showing that you can't actually build certain structures by evolution. But let's say you could. Intuitively, no, we, we look at the moon and we say, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't look like it's made of green cheese. And, and the same thing applies in life. Yeah. That the appearance of design in life most naturally fits the explanation that life is designed. And it's hard to think of any other explanation for it. And in fact, when you think of the fact that God has designed creatures to adapt, it, it just boggles the mind. We don't have a good analogy for that level of design and engineering.
we again try to imitate the design we see in nature the existing structures the existing aerodynamics of the cheetah and so forth but designing a car let's say to adapt to winter conditions and summer conditions and rain and shine we design cars to be able to withstand a variety of environments but to actively assume various forms under different circumstances that, that's just a whole level of design and engineering that we can't even touch yet so not only do we does creation explain the obvious evidences the popular evidences equally well as evolution it explains the most fundamental fact of biology much better than evolution does and when we drill down into the genetics this is the last point i'd make i guess in the elevator is when you look at the most important lines of evidence for evolution the most important field of science when it comes to the origins question that's the field of genetics creation actually explains it better you get down to the technical evidences creation explains the technical evidences for evolution far better than evolution itself does and there's there's great irony here one of the subfields of genetics in which creationists are actively succeeding and surpassing evolution is the rate at which genetic mistakes or mutations occur mm -hmm. here we have the engine of evolution and irony of ironies it's the creationists who are doing a better job making <laughs> predictions about the rates at which this is, should occur it's sort of uh swiping from the evolutionists the, the most fundamental aspect of their theory to it to achieve an end they never wish to have achieved so on on these four points the obvious evidence the popular evidence the technical evidence and then the most fundamental aspect of life creation either is equal to evolution or it exceeds it and so this is sort of a snapshot of, of the major salient points i make in these books the reasons we have to replace darwin and the the, the salient points believers can make when engaging someone who thinks it's just ridiculous to think that somehow science supports what genesis says and that intelligent people would actually look to genesis for scientific inspiration and, and guidance for their research yeah and so a, a common argument from evolutionists would be that creation isn't science because it doesn't make predictions but i know you've made a number of predictions in, in your book can you tell us about the success of some of those yeah and i want to step back for a minute i'm i've been mulling over publishing a book replacing darwin for kids and this is such a key point i've been thinking through how do you explain this concept of testable predictions to children and i want to camp out on this for a minute just because at least in the united states there is a whole legal field revolving around this concept you look back to decisions made in the u.s courts in the early 1980s when there was a raging debate here in the United States and they were trying to incorporate creationism into the public school curricula. So here we have uh, private schools, but the vast majority of people go to state funded public schools. And there's been, of course, strong opposition to have anything, anything creationist in these schools. Well, legal decisions were handed down in the early eighties. And one of the main things that the judges decreed was that creationism isn't science because it doesn't make testable predictions. So. There's, there's the legal backstory, at least here on this side of the pond, to why this is so fundamental. And evolutionists love to cite it. That's, that's why they love to cite it. See, it's, it's, you can't legally do that in the schools. because Obviously, here's the standard of science as dictated by these judges. And your, your ideas don't meet that standard, so keep them out of my classroom. Don't, don't indoctrinate our children with your religious ideas. Mm -hmm. So what is a testable prediction? In a, in a philosophical sense, philosophy of science sense, it's a it's a statement that future observations, future experiments could be revealed to be true or false. So gravity is a scientific idea because it predicts that if I pick something up and drop it, it'll fall to the floor here close to the surface of the earth. And me picking something up like this, uh, here I have a water bottle. If I pick this up and then I drop it, gravity predicts, so me letting go is still future, gravity predicts that it's gonna fall. Thinking of how to explain it to my kids, how do you communicate this concept of the passage of time, which is so central to the idea of Tesla predictions? Well, we measure time here in terms of sleeps. We're going to grandma's house in 10 sleeps, and somehow that helps them understand my, my seven-year-old and younger. Okay, if I go to bed, wake up the next morning, I got to do this 10 times or seven times, and then finally be the day to go to grandma's house. So what's a testable prediction if I explain it to my kids? It's you, you say something, you sleep, you wake up and you see if it's true. There's your testable prediction at a seven-year-old level. 
And that's the essence of the creation evolution debate. Evolutionists say we don't do this. So now you can explain it to your kids. Here's what they say we can't do. And the, the reality is that's factually incorrect. So I've put the date of this scientific article here down here in the lower part of the screen, January 2018. That's significant because this finding, this announcement was published several months after I published my book in fall of 2017. And one of the predictions I made, so we put the book in print and there were many sleeps that followed before this paper came out, was that there would be a certain rate at which species form. And so this comes from the concept of, of Noah taking kinds on board the ark, which is about the level of family, those kinds coming off the ark and then forming new species. And given just 4,500 years of history instead of millions of years of history for animals, there's very different predictions that evolution makes versus what creationists makes on the rate at which species form. Well, exhibit A for evolutionary biology has been these, these Darwin's finches. There's a group of finches, a few of them shown here in the Galapagos Islands and only in the Galapagos Islands that have been studied for several decades. Well, this brand new finding that was announced in January 2018 was in this particular this species of finch. They said a new one formed. And I found out about this actually in February, Darwin's birthday, a favorite day for evolutionists to try to put a stick in the eye of creationists saying, na 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 see what you don't know or can't do. And so they were announcing, here, you know, here's a good thing to, to shove in the face of a creationist. Well, if you run the math about the rate at which these species have formed, and this is the only known example that I know of, that is a real-time measurement of a new species forming. So here's our first example of a, of a formation of a new species documented in real time. And what is the rate? It matches exactly what the Bible predicts. It's remarkable. It's, and again, it's highly ironic. Just, just as creationists are predicting the speed with which copying mistakes occur at the genetic level, the engine of evolution. We are also predicting the rate at which species form in their favorite example of evolution. Darwin's finches are what shows up time and time again in the evolutionary textbooks as to here's evolution in action. I've also made testable genetic predictions in the book and one I want to highlight here real fast because this is what's ongoing right now. If you go to Ken Ham's Facebook page or to the Answers in Genesis YouTube channel, I'll probably end up doing about 20 of these presentations. We've recorded about six and premiered about six of them, uh, looking at predictions in human genetics. So if the human DNA, if our global human DNA is only a few thousand years old and not 200,000 years old, you should see, here's a prediction, testable prediction, and one I put in replacing Darwin. You should be able to see the stamp of human history all throughout the human family tree based on DNA. And uh, episode six is one we just premiered over the past weekend where I look at the history of human population growth and boom, you see it showing up time and time again. The, the world population growth has a shape like this. And I won't spend the time deriving it because you can see it in the most recent video how we how, how dna records human population growth but you can infer it so here's here's the shape of human population growth mm -hmm. with uh, the numbers here on the right if you take a published tree from this particular paper an evolutionary paper but uh you, you can infer population sizes from this and say what is the history of population growth which i'm the plot on this axis again i'm zooming through this explanation but the point is this is a smoking gun of human history and i've titled that episode part six, episode six, the smoking gun of human history. You can see perhaps the most profound echo of human history. World population growth has this hockey stick shape. You can see it in our family tree. Shouldn't be here if the human population is hundreds of thousands of years old. So that's one of other testable predictions we've made and we're already seeing them come true. So let me back up here for a second, clarify the legal case against creationism is that we don't make testable predictions. We don't make statements, sleep on it, wake up and see if they're true. The fact that I've put predictions in replacing Darwin already means that legal case is rendered null and void and I'm not the first person to do it. You can look at the history of young earth creationist geology and so forth, other fields of science. We've done this, that argument is invalid, void and outdated. Mm -hmm. What's even crazier is we've taken it a step further and those predictions are coming true. And I've highlighted the Darwin's Finches one in the replacing Darwin made simple. This one about human history, where we're rewriting it essentially, seeing the echo of it and rewriting it, post-states the publication of that book. So the YouTube channel right now is the best place to find it. And I'm hoping this will lead to a book in 2021, which is the 150th anniversary of Darwin's explanation for human origins. 
his book, The Descent of Man. So creation actually ticks uh, the gold standard of science. It actually makes predictions, which is amazing. <laughs> and something the evolutionists have had no answer to. I don't see them. And it, well, what I should say is, because I'm on evolutionary blogs and other places where you on occasion see them discuss creationist findings. You never see the mainstream technical literature discuss it. But uh, I'm, I'm beginning to see the, the role reversal occurring. So historically, creationists have been the ones saying, well, evolution can't be true because this, this problem, X, Y, and Z. And evolutionists have said, in essence, you're wrong, and so what? You don't come up with a better explanation. Well, now, now we've not only surpassed them in science and come up with a better explanation, uh, these, these explanations are leading to predictions that are coming true. I'm beginning to see the roles being reversed for now. They're having to nitpick what we're saying. And I can say, number one, you're wrong. And number two, so what? Come up with a better explanation. It's, it's really wild to see the traditional roles for creationists and evolutionists trading places, essentially. Now they're having to take the traditional role of the creationists while I'm sitting here in the driver's seat. We're sitting here in the driver's seat saying, come up with something better if you want to call your idea of science. Great. And we shouldn't be surprised at that, given what we know about God's word and, and it being um, his revelation. But um, one of the stumbling blocks, I guess, for many people, Christians and non-Christians, is the age of the earth. But you actually have some great evidence from genetics to say, well, actually, the world can't be millions of years old. It, it points to actually around 6,000 years. Can you, can you tell us something about that? Yes. And before getting into the specifics, I just want to stamp my foot, so to speak, on this, this foundational concept that biology has embedded in it a time concept. This has big ramifications for the young earth versus old earth creationist debate. By and large, that's been dominated by astronomy, geology, and well, can't we find some common ground in biology? It's becoming almost impossible to talk about biological evidence without some reference to a time scale. So that doesn't work anymore, and it's going to make the dividing line between young earth creationists and old earth creationists all the more stark. And Frankly, from my perspective, I think young Earth creationists have zoomed into the lead on this, mm -hmm. and I have yet to see the old Earth creationists come up with good rebuttals. Well, rebuttals to what? Now the specifics of this, this evidence. So one of the evidences and one of the clocks in biology that we can point to as being consistent with the young Earth time scale is once again this, this rate at which species form. Now the evolutionists, of course, do not agree with my conclusion. I'm just taking their raw data and saying this is what it means, and of course they would find that horrific because they uh, they disagree with that total time scale, and and they they are they are want to avoid anything that that unsettles the established millions of years time scale. But that's that's one evidence. This this paper that came out and the implications for the rate of species formation in Darwin's finches. This is one of probably many more evidences to come. That's one general category. The rate at which species form is a clock. The current clock, the current data that we have, points very clearly and unambiguously towards the post-flood time scale. In the Replacing Darwin book from 2017, I go through a lot of other evidences, technical genetic evidences, genetic clocks and various species that point towards a recent origin. What I think will hopefully really break this debate open, I want to hit this again, is the evidence within human DNA, because this is something everyone can relate to, everyone cares about this, you know, find the average person who cares about the rate at which fruit fly change their DNA. You won't find too many. Everyone wants to know who they came from. This is a hot topic. And the evidence that's coming in overwhelmingly points towards the recent time scale. Again, one of the best smoking guns. Not only do we have data from maternally inherited DNA and paternally inherited DNA, the rate at which this change occurs points toward the young earth time scale. But some of these other things you'd expect to be true if our DNA is in fact young, are showing up to be true. So DNA records family trees. This is, let me derive just real fast here, the basis for what I just showed. DNA records a family tree because there's differences that occur between us. We can recreate a family tree of humanity. And if you think about what family trees tell us, 
So in my family, I've, in, in thinking about male inheritance, I've got three boys. I've got three branches coming off my tree. The number of branches reflects the number of sons I have. The number of branches on the family tree, the family tree around the globe, reflects the population size of people around the globe. And if you go back in time through history, throughout the deeper branches of the family tree, it's gonna reflect that as well. So DNA records family trees, family trees record changes in population size. Therefore, the DNA family tree of humanity should record and reflect this hockey stick shape of human population growth. It's been slow and gradual for over 2000 years, beginning in 1000 BC and around just after the Black Death, especially in Europe. Uh, this, this began to spike upwards due to advances in agriculture, medicine, and so forth. So if, if, if the family tree of humanity is only a few thousand years old, it should reflect this hockey stick shape. And because DNA records changes in population size, we can infer that from this family tree, and there it is. This structure should not be that. This is a positive evidence for creation. This isn't so much, well, evolution can't explain this. It's, Hello, people. If you look at the entirety of the family tree, this is the shape that shows up again and again and again. It's hard to miss. And boy, is this exactly what you'd expect if the family tree is young. So this is a, hopefully, a, 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 just the beginning of, of the evidences as, as the series goes on that we're premiering again on Facebook and showing on our Answers in Genesis YouTube page. We'll talk about more regional evidences. One example, when we get to the history of the Americas, especially the pre-Columbian Americas, we know that once Columbus and Europeans arrived, the indigenous population underwent a massive crash. This is mainstream science. It, it, it went on for about 300 years and then recovered. The evolutionists talk about the crash. They don't see the recovery. One of the papers that is in press right now, a technical research paper, shows that no, only with the young Earth timescale can you see the crash and recovery. This is, this is a, a regional example of this same type of data. So again, this is just the beginning of we know these events happen in history. They shouldn't show up in our DNA and boom, there they are. We all know these historical events. They're not obscure things. We know about the Mongol conquest of most of Eurasia and Eastern Europe. These sorts of things should be showing up again and again. And these are the types of things we're seeing, testable predictions. And again, types of evidences you can see only if you view it through the lens of 6,000 or 4,500 years and not through the lens of hundreds of thousands, millions of years as the evolutionists say. It's amazing, and, and the fact is, you, you cannot argue with that evidence, right? I'm anxious to see how the evolutionists <laughs> try. Their main arguments have been with, um, and, and let me just add a little side note here. They are aware of the mitochondrial DNA. This is DNA inherited through mom. They're aware of the paternally inherited DNA, those clocks where you measure and count the number of differences between mothers and daughters, fathers mm -hmm. and sons, to get a sense for the speed at which this clock ticks. Well, one of the main rebuttals has been, if they finally acknowledge that the data is real and legitimate and, and valid is, well, this is an artifact of the modern era. Perhaps it was slower in times past, or maybe natural selection eliminated some of those other mutations in times past. And so this is how they try to reconcile the facts with their predictions. Uh, one of my first responses to them would be, well, how does your natural selection explanation make testable predictions? How is that any different from saying, well, God did it? You know, they love to make fun of creations. God did it. That explains everything. Well, natural selection did it. How is that scientific? Yeah. <laughs> Give me a prediction. You won't find any that I can see where, where there's, there's a statement that future observations could reveal to be true or false. Well, in a sense, that argument is saying, well, we've got a, we've got a piece of data from the present, mother, daughter, DNA differences, father, son, DNA differences, and we extrapolate it back in time. The data that I'm showing here are not data taken from the present and extrapolated back in time. This, in a sense, really is historical data. This is taking the branching structure throughout the whole tree, throughout the whole history of humanity. There really is no way you can try to say, well, what's going on in the present was different in times past. This is the past, according to the evolutionists themselves, and no one that I've seen has yet to try to touch this. Wow, that's amazing. Well. Thank, thank you for joining us tonight, Nathaniel. It's been some great food for thought for people. Hopefully, um, if you want to dig further into this, um, then please do get one of the, the copies of either Replacing Darwin or Replacing Darwin Made Simple. Pass them out.
I'm taking the challenge to them now and saying, hey, let's go out and there's a, there's a fox in the woods. I bet you I can tell you how fast his mutation rate is. 